Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. Once again, it's Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. I'm delighted to be joined uh, by two people, an old friend and someone who I hope will become a new friend. The old friend is Josh Scharfstein. Uh, Josh is Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, he is a uh, professor of public health. Josh is also on uh, our editorial board, and I've known him now close to 20 years. His co-author of this viewpoint that we're going to be discussing is Chris Morfu, and Chris is the dean of Johns Hopkins School of Education and a professor of education at Johns Hopkins University. They're going to be discussing what I believe is amongst the most urgent issues facing the United States. Yesterday, we published a viewpoint by the two of them entitled The Urgency and Challenge of Opening K-12, K-12 through Schools in the Fall of 2020. Josh and Chris, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having us, Howard. Thanks, Howard. So, Chris, why don't we start start with you? Um, why is uh, let's put the medicine, the medical stuff aside? What are the educational issues? Let let let's start with the educational issues. They should come before the medical issues. Well, I think there are there are myriad issues, Howard. We when the article we focus on. Uh, two or three if we think of the most pressing issues. And I would, I would start by highlighting um, what another year or extended period of time uh, where at-risk kids don't have access to schools, what that could potentially do to this generation of students. And I think in the article we highlight the need for, uh, in the reopening, to focus on the children who are most at risk and prioritize those with the greatest needs. And I would start there in terms of the urgency of opening schools. Now, in the article, you talk about almost 55 million children were affected by the school closing. Um, when you talk about reopening in the fall, uh, Chris, do you, do, you talk, do you think about it as in person or technologically or digitally? Well, I think there is going to be, um, I think there's going to be a real need to open um, physically, right? Open with with schools reopening because there is so much uh, unknown about remote learning and the, what we're starting to see in some of the earliest sort of surveys that are, that are coming out is we're seeing reports from children who are saying that they aren't learning as much, that they don't have access to people to help them, uh, that they don't feel as comfortable learning. And um, schools, uh, schools are just coming to grips, really, with what we talk about in the article, the need to link curriculum and remote learning strategies, something that most schools weren't good at um, in March and April and had to become good at um, uh, by, you know, very, very quickly. So I think the need to reopen schools physically is very important. Um, but there also needs to be uh, the preparation for the very, you know, uh, significant um, reality that we may need to go to hybrid or remote learning at some point during the academic year if there's a spike. We've already seen that in South Korea. South Korea reopened their schools and in, and in stages and actually had to close some of them again. They're reopening again because there was a spike in, um, in infection rates at some, of the, at some of the schools. So schools need to be prepared, I think, for both for reopening physically, but also for the, for the significant likelihood that at some point during the school year, there's going to be some periods of time where they're going to have to go with remote or hybrid learning strategies. Now, Josh, school, schools provide health uh, support in different ways for, for children and young adults. Um, it's, not, it's not just traditional education. And in the viewpoint, you outline some of the services that are available in schools. Can you talk about that? Because again, that, that's lost when schools close. Sure. And, you know, the most obvious may be school breakfast and lunch. 20 million kids rely on that. And we know that uh, hunger among kids has really uh, zoomed up um, as a result of the uh, coronavirus. So that's a very serious problem. And it affects, um, you know, child development and uh, suffering in all, all kinds of different ways. Um, there's also actual physical health services. And there are a few school based health centers that have been able to do some telemedicine. But by and large, it's very hard. And a lot of kids rely on uh, health services in school. But more generally, you know, what kids get from school isn't just, you know, the three R's. The, the kids get a lot of social and emotional development. They get 
their relationship with the teacher, which is extremely important, um, you know, for, for them and uh, their development, their friends. Um, and so cutting kids off from that over a critical period of their lives for an extended period is really detrimental to them. You know, there's another thing, too, which is uh, very difficult which is the fact that teachers um, and other school officials recognize about uh, one in five uh, cases of um, uh, concern for child abuse mm. and are responsible for about one in five reports. And so all those cases aren't getting uh, reported now. So kids could really be um, uh, suffering quite a bit. Uh, Josh, you know, since you worked at the FDA, I always said being FDA director is the hardest job in American medicine. And for the last couple of months, I thought it was being Tony Fauci. Now I think it's being a mayor or a governor. I, I, I mean, so they're making a lot of health decisions, mayors and governors. Obviously, they get a lot of advice, but um, I, I think uh, because the, the role of the federal government, the role that they've chosen to take, many of these decisions are now resting with mayors and governors. So say the mayor of Baltimore calls both of you up and says, let's have a meeting. How do you even think, if you're a mayor, about how you think about o opening up, explaining risk, uh, making it as safe as possible. H how do you even think about that? Well, uh, maybe I'll give it some uh, initial thoughts and turn to Chris. I think it's really important for people to understand that there, there's nothing that's perfectly safe and there's no activity, including staying home, you know, that is uh, perfectly safe. If people are going out into the world, they can bring it back into the house. So the question is, how do we uh, create an environment which is as safe as reasonably possible for kids and for teachers and for others while respecting the fact that there may be some people who view that amount of risk as too much and giving them an opportunity for all online learning. So I think, you know, if there's a, a grandmother taking care of her kids who's worried about getting coronavirus and getting very sick because of her age or other underlying conditions, you know, I think there should be an option for uh, safety. Uh, you know, to, to, to have a fully online option there for as much safety as you possibly can do. But for um, other parents being honest about what those risks are, low risks, and here's what we're doing to keep that risk as low as possible. And so in the article, we put forward a bunch of different specific things that schools can do to restructure to, to keep that risk uh, minimized. Chris, what's your sense of this? I, I mean, you've lived in the world of education. I'm sure you've helped schools think through really complicated issues, none could be more complicated than this. Right, and that's that's exactly what I what I would be talking about is the the, the complicated nature of this. Having had uh, discussions recently with state superintendents, with um, um, district level superintendents, um, I think it's impossible to overestimate the complexity of of this decision. Um, if you think about what schools do, um, Josh has outlined some of the what they do um, beyond the three R's, mm -hmm. as he said, in terms of um, in terms of health. Um, but if you think about the ability to transport children to schools, the facilities issues that are going to come into play here, um, you know, everything from you know, on the school bus side, for example, um, millions of kids get to school every every year, every day uh, on school buses. Is that even going to be possible? Um, when school buses are set up as as they're set up, uh, desks that are two meters apart. What does that mean with regard to facilities? I think I would as I would start by emphasizing the complexity of this and trying to work with mayors and state superintendents to talk about what they can control. Because as Josh said, ultimately there's we're not going to get to a no risk situation. So I think prioritizing what you actually can control and what you can do, uh, and acknowledging the complexity of this would be the would, would be where I would start. Is it your sense that the answers may be a bit different based upon the location? Like I, when I spoke to Tony Fauci yesterday and I asked him just briefly about schools because I knew we were doing this today, he said, look, the, it may be different in Wyoming where there's no cases versus a city or, or a, a town where there's a lot of cases. But, but do you see it varying either by location or by age of the student body that you're talking about? Yeah, I, I think I think location really matters. I'm from a rural county in, in in northern Iowa, and I can tell you there are something approximating zero cases in the county I'm I'm from, with you know one school district in the county. So that's a very different situation than Baltimore City Public Schools or Howard County Public Schools here here in Maryland. Um, but I do think age matters, and I think one um, one approach that um, districts need to be thinking about is 
um, and we, we, I think we touch on this in the article, is the idea that there are some children at some age levels who learn better um, with remote, um, learn better remotely. And there are some, uh, so you might think about, for example, high schoolers versus elementary age students. We know that children, that elementary age students uh, don't do as well with remote um, learning strategies. We also know that children learn more in school in terms of making gains more early on than they do later. Um, so the idea of, at, you know, and when you think about prioritizing resources, I think one of the things you have to think about beyond children who are at risk for um, a greater COVID slide, if you will, is children who are going to fare better with remote learning. And if you, ha- you have districts have a finite amount of resources and they should think about placing them where um, on remote learning and hybrid strategies where children are going to learn best with those strategies. Josh, um, there's a couple of questions that have already come in. How do you think of it from a medical standpoint? So Chris talked about the buses, and I'll, mm-hmm. I'll let other smart people figure that out. But but are children going to have to be screened? Or are they going to have to be told, like, we have signs all over our building. If you're sick, don't come to work. I feel like going, well, if you're reading that sign, it's probably a little late, but that's okay. But you, you, um, do you, are children going to have to be screened? or their parents going to have to be screened for COVID-19? Well, I'd start with the fact that it has to be a a real school community response because parents have to really understand the risk that's there and it's everyone's responsibility to keep that risk as low as possible. So I think it's more than just what happens at the school. If anyone is sick at home, I don't think the kids should go to school because you're worried that if someone else is Mm -hmm. sick, the children could be asymptomatic at the time, but able to pass the disease on to others. So you really want to have sort of a daily check in with everyone at home before the child even gets to school. At school, some basic screening is probably appropriate. And then the kids should be with a small group of other children and, you know, all day. So it's not like you're going to, you know, English with one group of kids and math Uh, with another group of kids. They need to stay together. So if there is uh, an infection, it's a relatively small group of kids that are exposed. And hopefully with the other measures, the spacing of the desks, that that really is contained. So you're really taking a lot of steps to contain it. But I I do want to circle back to this point. All of those things take resources. If you're going to have fewer kids in a classroom, you may need to hire more teachers. Going to the types of curricula that Chris is talking about, that's going to take resources. We have not had the serious discussion in this country about paying for the priority of kids to have a viable return to school strategy. And even though um, I absolutely agree with you, mayors and and governors have done a remarkable job in this moment as the federal government has stepped back, it's federal resources that I think are really necessary. And that's why in the article, we specifically say that if Congress can put all this money into all these other things and, um, you know, multiples of what would be required for schools, they really need to deliver for the nation's children. Yeah, I've, I've lost track of how many zeros the trillions have that that have been used, hopefully wisely. I'll, I'll let others decide about that. But you and I, when we were talking about this before, and then the article came in, I said, you got to mention money. I mean, cities and states are not going to have a lot of money. It, resources are going to decline. Their income is going right. to go down. They have to balance their budget. And, and actually, school systems could be asked to cut money at this exact right. moment in right. time, which is just in, you know, crazy. Uh, do, that's what typically would happen. Yeah. Do you have do both of you have a sense it's in the billions that this is going to take an act of Congress to say we will put billions of dollars into school systems so that children can come back to school? Well, the CARES Act provided 13 billion directly to K-12 districts. OK. And I don't I don't have a number for you, but I can assure you, Howard, and I think Josh would agree with this. It's going to be a, a multiple, a, a multiple of that. If you think about the staffing needs, the transportation needs, the facilities needs, um, the technological needs, um, all of these things are really going to be labor intensive and uh, resource intensive kinds of things. I don't know of any way to automate any of these kinds of things. Um, and if you think about, you know, Josh pointed pointed out what, you know, keeping kids in different kinds of groups, that's going to require uh, more teachers, more paraprofessionals, all those kinds of things. And we've seen evidence that that works in places like Norway and Finland where they've gone back to school already and kept kids together in those small groups and are seeing positive things occurring from that. But again, very resource intensive. Is there a role uh, for private industry or private companies to help in any way? I mean, we always reach to the federal government. 
you know, the Apples, the Microsofts, the Dells of the world from a technology standpoint, is there a way that they, they could help that would work with the school system or is it more complicated than I imagine? And I don't, I don't have an answer to that, Howard, but I can tell you that um, it, it, given the scale of the situation, I would certainly not dissuade um, state and, and the federal governments for, from ask, for asking for partnerships from whether it be Google with Chromebooks and, and Google Classroom. Um, certainly, certainly schools are using those technologies already, and whether it means donations of, of large amounts of hardware or software uh, to schools, that doesn't deal with the fact that, you know, 20 to 25 percent of, 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 of children under a certain age and in, and, and in different groups don't have access to the Internet. But, you know, Comcast has done some good things here yeah. in Baltimore, in the state of Maryland, and providing access. So it's worth um, it's worth noting that that, that organizations and, and for profits have stepped up in in these cases already. Yeah, I would just say that the ki- kinds of partnerships you could consider could also be at the at the community level with with major businesses and small businesses, you know, kind of adopting schools and, and doing things to help um, make all these changes possible. There's some pretty substantial foundations in, in the U.S. Uh, I, I mean, Josh, I, I, and both of you uh, are familiar with the Bloomberg Foundation. There's the Gates Foundation, generally global health, but they've done a lot in U.S., so you have Gates, you have Bloomberg, Ford, Rockefeller, Packard, Hewlett, Moore. Can foundations step up? It's easy for me to spend their money, but you know, I I genuinely believe this is a national priority, and and I I, I just feel like mayors are going to be overwhelmed, not not just with the logistics, but with the price tag. Well, I think there are some great examples of, of foundations uh, stepping up in all kinds of different ways. The problem is the total amount that they can give doesn't come close to what's okay. necessary and what government really has to provide. But, you know, the, in terms of helping individual, uh, you know, school districts afford some uh, basic technology for kids, foundations have, have done an important job there. I think foundations also could help um, with the research agenda, making sure that um, there's information that's available that could guide decisions. Um, but ultimately, for you know the hiring of who needs to be hired, the major changes in transportation, some of these other major shifts, I, I don't think there's a way to let Congress off the hook. A lot of questions. I'm not surprised. Thirty uh, percent of teachers are are older. I, I don't know what exactly older means. We've talked about it. So they are theoretically in higher risk groups, particularly if they're above sixty five and have mm-hmm. other uh, medical conditions. How do you think about protecting teachers? Well, one of the things that I would suggest and have suggested to um, school leaders right now is, um, you know, in the article we make a point about respecting um, the, the very real beliefs and, and fears that some teachers may have and some families may have. Um, there is a, we've got a three month window or so before schools are, are reopening again. It would be very wise of districts to try to identify teachers who are potentially at greatest risk. And um, one strategy would be to help think, help create um, some remote learning experts, some hybrid learning experts, because they're also going to be students and families that don't feel comfortable coming back. And given the significant likelihood that we're going to be moving to a, a hybrid system or remote system at some point, if you could create a uh, a core of, of some of your most experienced teachers who are um, experts at teaching other teachers, teaching the teacher model with regard to technologies. I think that would be a very good use of districts um, time and a recognition that um, they do have uh, an older teaching force. You two are a great pair because there's some medical questions and there's some education questions. I don't want to play the two, two of you off against one another, but Josh, this one's more, more uh, medical and um, you know, the question is how contagious are children? Are they more contagious or less contagious? Are they super mm-hmm. spreaders? Are they not super spreaders? Um, you know, JAMA later this week will probably be publishing amongst the best, if not the best article on this syndrome, this Kawasaki's mm-hmm. disease like syndrome. It's uh, 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 the publication is a case series. It has match controls, which will be helpful. It's rare. We know that for sure. But uh, in terms of children being more or less contagious, how do you think about that verse, uh, about them staying home, not staying home, masking, sure. not masking? Sure. So, you know, I think when this all started, 
the basic point of reference was influenza, which kids get quite a lot and yeah. are very important in the transmission of in a community. So school closures have a very strong record for influenza of reducing the spread in a community. Um, it looks like there are some serious differences between the coronavirus and influenza. How serious? We don't know for sure. But um, the, obviously, uh, kids are overall much less likely to get serious illness um, than uh, older adults. Uh, from the coronavirus. In addition, uh, I think it was a paper you published, Howard, showed that the uh, receptors may be uh, far fewer in um, uh, in children compared to adults, mm -hmm. um, suggesting that um, there may be a, a be harder perhaps to infect children. And there's some data suggesting that they're less likely to spread the virus than others. Um, and so uh, I would say the jury is still out. But when I talk to the infectious disease epidemiologists um, that I have been talking to a lot more um, these days, um, they seem to think that it is probably true that there's less. That doesn't mean there's none, though. And again, it doesn't mean that there isn't the risk of an outbreak. And we've seen from uh, some school systems opening that they do have cases. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a real threat, but it may well be less. And the overall contribution of closing schools to community spread for coronavirus is not... Um, fully known. And, and we really should be getting as much data as we possibly can out of the openings in other countries. And we'll know a lot more every single week. So one of our recommendations is for there to be a group. And I think the National Academies is starting to pull together a group that really looks at these data as they're coming out and, and make some specific uh, findings and recommendations. To the point about the multi-system inflammatory um, syndrome, it's obviously very uh, scary when um, I was one of your trainees, we saw Kawasaki's disease and that was a very scary uh, thing for to see uh, kids with. And, you know, we recently had a death of a young woman in Baltimore from this condition. So um, I think it's urgent that we understand more about this, um, including whether treatment can be effective. Um, understand more about the rate of the disease and whether there's any particular associations with either the type of virus or the type of exposure. Um, that could also have an impact on, on the guidance. As you said, it looks extremely rare right now and is a risk, just like the risk of serious illness, because it's not zero in kids, that will have to be you know, balanced. Um, and that, that's the risk we're trying to absolutely minimize as we open schools. Chris, there's one or two educational questions, and one or two really sparked my interest. Um, the advice you were giving on keeping the exact same students together all day is different than what I, this person writing, I heard from educators who recognize a student may have different needs for math and English. In addition, uh, you know, I thought many of the schools now move kids, move students around so that they're, they mix differently, they have different teachers. Does that need to end for the year or have to be done very differently or more carefully? Uh, Josh had mentioned it at the beginning, and then there's this question. And I'm wondering just how you think that through as an educator. Yeah, so to, you know, talking with Josh about this, he's, he's explained to me from a public health perspective how that would be useful. So I can't speak to the, to the, to the, the public health side of that. Mm. But I can tell you on the education side, it would require some changes, uh, particularly as children get older. Um, they're more likely to move from classroom to classroom and have right. different teachers for different for different subject matters. So you, you this is all going to be about balancing risk, right, and figuring out what works. And one of the one of the challenges is you can have all the social distancing guidelines in the world and you can keep desks two meters apart, but good luck getting um, you know six and seven year olds not to want to hug their teacher and touch their face and hug their friends and and it, it's going to be nearly impossible, if not impossible. And I think with the younger age children, the more that you acknowledge that reality, the more you think to yourself, OK, I need to keep them together. And because they are um, because the um, uh, the subject matter is or elementary uh, level, I think teachers are better equipped to actually handle all of the subjects together. So you could keep them together at the younger ages. And I think that's the way to think about this is, you know, can we can we expect um, juniors in high school to keep social distance? Well, I think more reasonably than we can expect first and second graders. So I think the advice to schools should be different um, for, for different level uh, children. There's a few questions about charter schools. Uh, charter schools somehow to me sit somewhere between public schools and kind of independent private schools. Um, and there, there are more of them. And in some urban areas, they're quite, quite popular. 
do, do school districts retain responsibility, any responsibility over charter schools? I, I don't quite know how they work. And if you're a parent with a child in a charter school, you're going to listen to this and you've created a charter school. How do you think about it? Is it the same thing? I, I just I don't know uh, how they're governed. Well, it, it's state, different state to state, Howard. So I, I can't I, you know, every every state is um, different with regard to charter schools. And in some states, there aren't um, there aren't charter schools to 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 worry about. Um, or certainly large numbers of them. Um, in Maryland, for example, um, the districts do would have um, say over, we operate a school in um, East Baltimore, for example. The Hopkins School of Education operates a public school in East Baltimore. It's a contract school. Some people might refer to it as a charter school. And uh, the district does have a say over how we operate um, and, and authorizes us to operate. Um, in other states, there is less oversight from from the local district. If I were a parent and I were sending my son or daughter to a charter school, I would certainly ask these kinds of questions. I would ask the questions about whether they are, um, whether they're, um, they're, um, the school is prepared, how are they prepared with regard to the CDC guidelines, some of the other things we're talking about, what actions are the, is the school taking, what training are they providing uh, to their teachers, to their paraprofessionals. I think those are all good questions that, teacher, that parents should ask of any school that their son or daughter goes to, um, regardless of whether it's a charter school or a traditional public school John, or an independent school. Or an independent. Josh, there's broad agreement uh, now, uh, and I uh, ho- hopefully f- in the coming months, that inside people need to wear masks. It's social distancing and wearing masks. There may be, there may be more flexibility outside. Well, mm-hmm. Let's put that aside and, and large groups and little and smaller groups. Is, is it your notion that children are going to have to mask when they, they come to school? Or is it going to be dependent upon their age? Or is that even possible for five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds? What's your sense of that? So, you know, just to your first point, though, um, outdoors appears to be uh, less hospitable to the transmission of the virus. And right. to the extent, weather permitting, kids can go outside. Mm-hmm. I, I think that would be great. You know, so I think that it opens up a little bit more of the outdoor classroom concept um, to lower risk if possible. In terms of masks, you know, the CDC says where possible. I I think recognizing that at some ages it's just not possible. And I think that's the reason to keep the number of kids low and to keep them kind of cohorted and to have a very strong understanding with the parents that anyone sick at home, the child doesn't come um, to school. So and, and, you know, there's an alternate plan for them. So I think uh, you're, you're just going to have to uh, figure it out based on what kids can do. You can't force kids to be at a different developmental stage than the ones they're at, unfortunately, um, or in, in, in the case of pediatricians. Fortunately, we love all the developmental stages of kids. So it's early June. Schools begin to open in mid to late August at the earliest, usually around September. So you have June, July and August, three months. Uh, for mayors, superintendent mayors and governors, but superintendents, you're just getting through what was the so-called first wave. Hopefully, there will not be large flares. So you have some months to prepare. Let's put the money aside. We'll return to the money because I think it is critical. If you're a mayor and and your your aide or the mayor or the governor or the superintendent reads the viewpoint or sees this live stream or listens to the podcast, what do they do on Monday? What, 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 are, what do they begin to, th- how, how do they even think about organizing themselves? Now, it may obviously depend upon the size. If it's a school that uses buses, I would say you're going to have to have a bus committee to figure out what you're going to do. Mm-hmm. But, but what's, what's the first three, four, five steps? Who, who's involved in the decision making? You know, I would, uh, I'll take a first shot at this question. It's very important. This is an all hands on deck moment now, not mid July, mid August when it's, you know, right around the corner. And it's very important for the school systems um, to be engaged with all of the key groups that need to be rowing in the same direction to be able to accomplish this incredibly difficult uh, challenge. And so that involves uh, teachers, the teachers unions, parents, um, the bus drivers, you know, um, kids, if they're, uh, you know, maybe high school kids, whatever you can, and set up a structure, not just for input, but for decision making that, um, you know, it is has clear deadlines for when key decisions have to be made, and then can be implemented. Um, so it's really like an emergency response 
kind of uh, decision making structure that I think a school system should adopt, just like, you know, a city may have a, a emergency approach to organizing food deliveries. This is sort of how do we get the schools really ready? Um, every single one, how do we, um, you know, think through all these challenges to, to make them work? And, and I'm sure at the school level, the principals are going to have to be doing something somewhat similar, uh, thinking uh, and working very hard starting now to really be ready for the fall. Chris, what's your sense of what, you know, the superintendent listening to this has to start to think through on Monday? So um, Josh mentioned unions. Um, the teacher professional school leaders are going to play a big, big role in this. And I would do everything I can to um, begin those discussions and to try to find um, where the problems are going to be in terms of um, uh, existing contractual arrangements and, and work, uh, work standards with unions. That's, that's going to be uh, complex in and of itself. The other thing I think I would encourage um, at the state level and the local level, I would think about what are the things that could actually be centralized at the state level in terms of training and resources mm -hmm. and um, uh, guidelines here. And I think there are going to be a number of those things. I think um, regardless of, um, let's say, regardless of, of what the district is like, um, teachers, principals are going to need some extra training. Summer is a, a, a good time to do that. Um, the state could take some of that away, potentially away from the districts and provide um, some standardized training um, that so districts don't have to do it. Districts are going to have enough to do at the local level. And I think anything that um, the state could take off their hands and do appropriately at scale and potentially even uh, more efficiently at scale, um, they should they should be looking at dividing and conquering uh, in that way a, as well. So I would I would you know start talk, thinking about um, I talked earlier about. Um, looking at your your teacher workforce, part of that is talking with unions, but part of it is is realizing that some portion of that may not be able to come into the classroom. How are you going to use those? I would also start thinking about technology as as quickly as you can. There is a very significant chance you're going to need to do um, hybrid learning, whether that whether because you're going to keep your high schoolers um, out of school for the entire year, or you're going to go to an A B schedule, or you're just preparing for that spike. That's going to keep you out of the classroom for, you know, two months, three months, whatever it's going to be. And thinking now about what, what are the technologies that you're going to need and, and buying hardware and software and training teachers to use that during the first month or so of uh, the, the, the pandemic uh, this spring, schools were very clearly not ready. They had not trained their teachers to use the technology. And if you look at what schools are doing now, it's a big improvement over mm -hmm. what they were doing uh, a month or six weeks ago. So schools got up to speed really quickly. But this is the time to be training people how to use the technology that you're going to need uh, come academic year. There's a few other questions, but there's one, and then I want to close. It's It's been longer, but I, uh, Josh knows I, I, I feel like this is such a national uh, national issue. Um, what, what about all those other activities go on in school, after-school sports or after-school clubs or, you know, just uh, prolonged days so, so parents can work? I mean, it's often... Uh, low-income families that are very dependent on schools for after-school programs because they're working, working one job or two jobs. How do you th think of everything that's built around that nine to three or ten to four school day? What happens to those activities? Well, I think from a public health standpoint, each one has to be analyzed on its own and asked whether it can be made safer. So choir practice may not be able to be made safer given the risks of transmission of the virus. So that activity may not be in the cards for this year, but um, it's possible that uh, other types of clubs and activities could exist with social distancing, particularly if there's a low level of community transmission. Um, you know, schools will have to coordinate with public health about how much uh, virus is circulating in the community and what the risks are, but with social distancing and and different protocols, you probably could fit in a number of different activities. Sports is going to be a challenge, particularly sports where, you know, physical contact is the point. Um, so uh, that uh, will be, I think, probably pretty hard uh, to do this fall if there's um, community transmission of the virus. Chris, you have a sense of these extra activities that are so critical for certain children, and certain parents? Yeah, and I think that's I, I would echo what what Josh just said, but building on what you just said, Howard, um, I think I think schools and communities um, 
need to also acknowledge the role of after school activities. It's not just about, um, you know, winning a game or uh, becoming the best choir you can become. It's also um, they, they play a role in after school care, in, in providing students with a, a safe and safe environment after school. Uh, for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, mm. of, of students who are after school. It's also in many cases, we've talked about breakfast and lunch. Uh, we serve a thousand meals. We serve a thousand dinners a week at the school we operate in um, in East Baltimore here. And we're not alone. So there are you know hundreds of thousands of kids who are getting um, getting their third meal of the day at school after their after school activity. So I would be thinking about um, I think the question is, um, what activities can we do that are that are relatively low risk? But also, what can we do with the children who are in the high risk activities and put them into clubs or activities that are lower risk activities? So you still get the the, the benefits of after school um, activities and after school care that, that the schools provide. Let's let's return to the money uh, to finish it. Josh, you know a little more about the federal process than I do. You were at the FDA and uh, you've been in government both at Baltimore Whatever the dollar amount is, fifty billion dollars, a hundred billion dollars, a quarter of a trillion dollars. Mm-hmm. How do we get there? How do we get Congress to recognize c- cities and states simply do not have the financial resources to remake the way they educate fifty-five million students in this country? Right, we're facing just an enormous uh, challenge in public finance at the state and local level because of the coronavirus, because it's a double hit. They, they've had to right. spend a lot of money for different things. And of course, with the economic collapse, uh, the money coming in is less and they have, generally speaking, balanced budget requirements. So it's a, um, a, a very serious problem. In the last recession, uh, it was money from the federal government to states that really made it possible for the country not to have a total... Um, depression. And uh, we're facing that now because unfortunately with the political polarization we're in, you know, there's a standoff over whether to supply basic funding to states so states can meet basic requirements, including education. Hopefully that stalemate will be broken um, and we'll get past the, you know, that very serious threat. And as part of that, some additional money should be put in uh, for this purpose. I think it's it's very much an investment in the future. You know, we'll get past the pandemic, but the effects of the pandemic will be much longer and we can um, control some of that. We don't want to have the children being, uh, you know, harmed for many years because of our failure to provide for them now. Yeah, spared the acute disease only to have years and years of uh, 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 educational challenges because of we didn't deal with it. Uh, for the upcoming year or two, Chris, your sense of the money. I, I would talk about I would talk about two things. I would talk about the the long term impact, as Josh just said, on um, that some people are calling the potential COVID slide. Here, um, we know about the effects of things like summer melt, and if we're talking about a sixteen month summer melt, um, potentially for some kids who don't have access to the internet, who can't take advantage of um, what their school systems are offering for them, um, that would be. You're going to you can't make those you can't make those things up in in schools and those children are going to be perennially behind. And that's going to have a very long term impact on the economy. The other thing I would emphasize and is is the economic role that schools play. If schools aren't open, what does that mean in terms of who needs to stay at home in terms of child care? Um, there's a huge economic impact to think about this um, to think about this as well and the role that schools play in our local state and, and, and uh, national economy. This is Howard Bachner, editor in chief of JAMA, and you know we we've published almost 150 articles uh, related to COVID-19, uh, many on clinical issues, public health issues. Um, this issue is a bit a bit different, in part perhaps because I'm a pediatrician, in part because Josh and I spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about it. I think the issue of sc- schools opening in the fall have begun has begun to emerge in the popular press, but uh, we're hoping that this viewpoint by Jeff Sharstein and Chris Murphy, the urgency and challenge of opening K-12 schools, K-12 through schools in the fall of 2020, which was published on Monday in JAMA, will stimulate uh, a national discussion about, uh, about how we move forward. Um, there's a quote from the viewpoint, reopening schools this fall is an urgent national priority. 
Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Josh and Chris, thanks so much for spending time with me uh, today. I hope you get some calls from superintendents and mayors and governors over the next few days. Thanks for having us, Howard. Thanks, Howard. Enjoyed it. Bye-bye.